Are there any of these prompting techniques that really stood out to you? Or I would say the number one technique that I've I've uh, added to my toolkit is contrastive chain of thought prompting. It it really was not something I thought of before. All right, welcome everybody to Archive Dives with Oxen AI. Today we'll be doing part two of the prompt report paper. If you missed part one, we did it two weeks ago and went into the basics of prompting and some getting started techniques. Today, we'll be going through a, a little more advanced techniques. Uh, there's 53 in the paper and a really awesome taxonomy of these things that the authors laid out. And today, we're lucky enough to have the lead author of the paper on the call with us. So if we have any questions live, Sander will be here to help answer them. And Sander, if you want to give a brief intro about yourself and maybe what inspired you to write this paper. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks for doing that first video on the paper. Really fantastic to see the impact it's had so far. So I'm Sander. I am the CEO of learnprompting.org, which was actually the first guide on prompt engineering on the internet uh, way back in October 2022. So this was pre-chat GPT. Uh, and so I am an artificial intelligence researcher in natural language processing and deep reinforcement learning. Uh, and so I've done research at the University of Maryland for the past four, uh, five years, and it has focused a lot on the board game diplomacy, uh, which kind of like risk and getting bought to trick humans. Uh, and then more recently on prompting and prompt security. So I actually ran the first global prompt injection competition, which was sponsored by OpenAI and 12 other AI companies, uh, Hack a Prompt. And then I wrote the prompt report, uh, which was the most comprehensive uh, study and survey of prompting ever done and why we are here today. Uh, and the inspiration for that I think uh, it was kind of a natural extension of the learn prompting website, because uh, for that, I had basically read, you know, hundreds uh, of papers, articles on prompting and, you know, collected everything. Uh, and so that was kind of a survey in and of itself. Uh, and so a natural next step was to do a more formal academic survey. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of terminology and, and techniques and what works, what doesn't, questions uh, in the space that we were able to clear up in the paper. And so all of those kinds of things are very much top of mind. Uh, so as you'll see, I mean, as you've seen going through the paper, we have very uh, complete taxonomies and discuss the origins of different terms. Um, certain terms have uh, you know different meanings when they're used in different ways. Uh, there's a lot of words that have same definitions, and we try to like sort of push one definition for each thing. Uh, so very much focused on making the discussion uh, in the space more more consistent, getting people to use a common language. And so that is why I wrote the paper. Amazing. And as I've been going through it, each little subsection within the taxonomy links out to complete other archive papers. So it's like a rabbit hole after rabbit hole of different techniques. And I come from the more traditional machine learning background, like training models from scratch, uh, large language model world. So, you know, all the way back to the 2012s, 2013 timeframe. So when some of this prompt engineering stuff first came out, I'll admit I was a little skeptic and I'm like, oh, can you really prompt engineer your way out of these problems? But I, I really think after going through this paper and seeing all the different techniques and how you can apply them, it's it's changed my mind. And there's a lot of value into studying these techniques and whether it's for even synthetic data generation for like the, the the next set of models kind of eking out what these models know through prompting i think is a really interesting field of study so excited to dive in with you today cool so i will be sharing this notion doc so you guys can follow along if you want um i'll put it in the zoom chat right now and today, so last week we went through the first three giant sections of the paper. If you don't recall, there's a there's a big taxonomy within the paper, and feel free to pull it up while we're going through. Um, and I kind of broke it down between these six 
top level taxonomy nodes here. So there was zero shot, few shot, pretty straightforward techniques, um, pretty easy to learn and apply. Then it starts getting interesting when we get into thought generation, ensembling, self-criticism, and decomposition. Thought generation, we went pretty deep into last week with chain of thought reasoning. And then there's a bunch of uh, nodes from there for zero shot chain of thought, few shot chain of thought, and then all of these other chain of thought techniques. Um, today, we'll be really focusing on this decomposition node, which I think is really interesting when it comes to reasoning within large language models. And I think it's just a gold mine for generating synthetic data or having these models kind of be the type two uh, or system two type thinking. When you think of like system one, system two type thinking, these de decomposition prompts really break down the problem into sub problems and then either recursively prompt or have the model kind of think through as they're solving. So each one of these is a full paper in themselves and could be treated like a, <laughs> a full archive dive in themselves. So we'll be going through and kind of do a whirlwind tour of each one and be running some prompts live as we do it. Um, Sander, some questions that I'll probably save for the end. Maybe you can noodle on while we're going through are Maybe what were some of the more surprising techniques that you found as you were going through the survey, or maybe just your your favorite ones, so ones that you'd like to highlight, because there's there's 58 in here. It's definitely going to be hard to go through all of them. Um, another one is just like, what are common things that you think people are missing when they're prompting, and maybe any follow-up work from this paper. So maybe noodle on those, and, and we'll come back to it at the end after we've gone through a few techniques. Hey, Greg. Yeah. Um, one more would be, has this analysis changed your mind about where to draw the line between what you should try to do during fine tuning and what you should try to accomplish through prompting? I love it. And what to accomplish prompting. Cool. That is always on my mind too. And I think this paper really changed my mind of you should definitely uh, try to prompt your way out of the problem first. And if that doesn't work, then go to fine tuning. But I'm I'm curious to take hear your take. Actually, Sander, if you want to hop in on that one right now, I feel like that's a good jumping off point. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I think the most sort of relevant place in the paper was when we did benchmarking of different prompting techniques. Um, and we actually did not do fine tuning for this paper, but we did discuss it. Uh, and I mean, the the sort of answer ended up being um, we were just going to focus on prompting for the paper. But in terms of follow up work, it would definitely be interesting to compare fine tuning and prompting for some of those tasks. Um, I get asked the question a lot, like, when do I fine tune versus when do I prompt? Um, and in a way, it depends on what you're doing. I think for me, it depends mostly on how much data you have. Uh, if you have a little bit of data, um, you, you have to prompt, you want to prompt. But if you have like hundreds of thousands of data points, then you want to fine tune. Um, it's always worth prompting uh, to see how that performs. Um, but you know, at, at some point you have to make a decision, like, are you really going to try out 20 different prompting techniques um, or are you can try fine tuning next? Uh, and it, it really completely depends on your team, your problem, what, what access to infrastructure you have. Uh, I'm trying to think about any, anything I've been doing with fine tuning recently. Uh, so if you look at, uh, are you familiar with the person who asked the question with Arc AGI? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, so it is this set of puzzles, kind of like IQ tests. Uh, yeah, you got it there. And this is actually my favorite benchmark for AIs uh, at the moment. And so the idea is given these, uh, you can see the first three puzzle pairs on the left uh, there. 
can you look at this new sort of input puzzle and predict what its output should be? There's some transformation uh, that brings you from the top puzzles to the bottom puzzles there. Uh, and so for something like this, uh, there's a lot of fine tuning being done. And part of the reason is because you kind of need to change the way, uh, find, say you know, you're finding an LLM for this task, you kind of need to change the way that the LLM is thinking because it's not a classic text generation task. Uh, it, it's solving really a completely different problem um, in a way in a different modality. So as you drift away from uh, you know, common text-based tasks, then you want to do more fine tuning. Uh, and even for this, like fine tuning transformer models um, provably uh, basically cannot work for these kinds of problems because uh, of the of, of certain restrictions in transformers where uh, I forget the word for it now, but they are uh, non nonlinear yeah, but what's the word when like there's the uh, they're, they're not turn complete. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, and a lot of times in these problems, you need to do things like count the number of squares and then uh, figure out uh, which color is most frequent. Uh, and so anyways, for this, something like fine tuning couldn't solve it. Uh, something like prompting alone couldn't solve it. Uh, and then you'd need to move on to make some kind of agentic architecture, which is what I actually believe will eventually solve this problem. Uh, so back to the original question, uh, I, I actually can't really give you a fantastic answer um, without knowing information about your specific problem. Yeah, no, I like that. I mean, typically I approach the question in terms of what would be the best, what, what would give me the best possible answer and then what would give me the easiest answer based on how tired I am, how much cognitive load I'm willing to endure. But, you know, your point, the thing you said immediately about it kind of depends on how much data you have. That's a, really a great point um, that that can kind of help guide the the results. So I appreciate your your feedback. Thanks so much. Good question. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and I I also like to think about the iteration cycle. And I think these two points you just made, Cameron, are great. Like, what is the easiest you know easiest way to solve the problem? How much coffee have I had in the morning? Just like it's a lot easier to prompt your way out of the problem and just get a sense of if the model knows it at all. And then once you wanna optimize for performance in terms of like speed or throughput or accuracy and you have enough data, then start going down the fine tuning route. But you know, it's so easy to prompt these things. You might as well start there. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. So let's dive in and get a quick refresher on thought generation because it's gonna get referenced throughout all of these techniques. And this is where we left off last week with chain of thought reasoning, and you'll see it abbreviated as COT in a lot of the papers. And you might even see like five shot COT when, it, when you're looking at different benchmarks. And even if you look at the outputs from like a GPT-4.0 type model, it's pretty clear that the model's been trained to think step by step. And so when you think chain of thought reasoning, think the phrase, think step by step, because that's really what kicked off this, this subset of papers. And one of the data sets that they mention um, within the thought generation part of these papers is this data set called SCAN. And SCAN is a bunch of tasks that look like this. Um, so you'll have a sentence that's like walk opposite right thrice after run opposite right. And the goal of, uh, of this data set is to be able to output like joystick, joystick-like actions from this natural language text. So it'd be like, turn right, turn right, turn right for the walk opposite right three times. Oh, I guess it would be turn left because I even messed that up, opposite right. Um, and when you put in this prompt to like a GPT-4 of just, hey, what direction is the person facing if they started facing north and they did these options. The first thing that GPT-4.0 does is that it says, 
let's break this step. Let's break the directions down step by step. Start facing north, run opposite right means turn left. And then it's it's like spitting out its thought process as you're going through and kind of reasoning its way through the problem until it can get to a final answer. And I didn't even prompt GPT-4 to like break it down step by step. It's just inherent to the training data that they learned that this was a useful technique for model models to solve problems. And they either through post-training or some sort of reinforcement learning encoded this into the model. So the models inherently do this without you having to prompt it. And so when we think about these techniques that we're going through today, think about how it could be used in post-training or fine tuning, uh, as well as just how it might be able to solve your problem just through prompting. Because I think, you know, these outputs that you see from GPT-40 make it make it very clear that that's what they were doing to to boost performance on some of these problems. So breaking it down a little farther from just let's think step by step. Uh, the section of the paper that we'll be going into today, to today is the decomposition part. So this is a common way that humans solve problems by breaking them down into simpler subproblems. And the first one within the section uh, is a really good illustration of this. It's called least to most prompting. And the paper link is here. Basically, what you do is exactly um what de decomposition is all about and so given a question and a language model you're going to want to prompt it to be able to break the question down into individual sub problems so i took the scan data set that we were talking about before um and here's a few more examples like look thrice after jump turns into jump look, look, look. So you can think of these as kind of like joystick commands for a, for a video game or something like that. Run left and walk turns into run underscore left, run walk. And I took some example prompts from the paper so we can kind of see how this works in practice. So at the end of the paper, they have this giant end shot prompt where they'll have the Q here, jump left, and A with some breaking down the sub problems within the problem <laughs> to figure out what the actual output should be. And so if you're curious, I have the entire prompt here. So we can take a look. Um, it's pretty long. So it's a lot of input tokens uh, for the model to process. And I think this is like a one, two, three, four. It's like a 10 shot example. Um, that we can feed into the model. So I ran this least to most prompt through GPT-40 and just had a hundred examples of, um, you know, walk opposite of right thrice after run opposite of right. And I'll move this guy a little bit so we can see. And given all of these end shot examples, the model starts to output its reasoning to find the opposite of walk right opposite uh, thrice. It'll have its first step, run opposite right, then its second step, walk opposite right thrice, and then the third step. And you can see it's kind of like breaking down the individual sub problems until it gets to the final output here. Um, and since the prompt in the paper didn't output it, you know, exactly with these tokens here, uh, we would have to tweak the prompt and tell it, hey, we want you to output with these exact strings. Um, but they didn't, you know, in the paper, they didn't have this exact output data set. So it was basically just trying to give it the examples of reasoning. So that's a pretty simple example, uh, kind of combines the end shot prompting that we were doing last week with some breaking it down uh, from the easiest least to most type prompting. The next way that you can decompose prompts is decomposed prompting with tools. So tool use is pretty interesting. And Sander, I really liked the way that you guys 
defined uh, agents in the paper as LLMs that can use tools. I don't know if you want to elaborate on agents at all, because you said that you think that's one of the more interesting areas when it comes to LLMs and, and solving these harder problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah, happy to talk about it a bit. I think one of the most um, sort of frustrating things for me about agents in like all of the current discourse is like people use all these different definitions. Uh, and so we had to be really careful with ours. Uh, and to me, it's always been you have some LLM or Gen AI, maybe it's a VLM, uh, and it has the ability somehow to call symbolic tools, um, like a calculator, make an API call, uh, whatever. Uh, and it is considerably difficult to implement agents, really any agent, because, um, you know, say you you wanted to call a calculator uh, and you tell it, okay, if you say the special keyword calculator and then put whatever you want to calculate in parentheses, then, you know, we'll, we'll do that for you. And so you have some if statements looking for that string, um, but what if it misspells the word calculator? What if it puts a space afterwards before the parentheses? What if there's a period after uh, it becomes a parsing issue? Uh, and so that's just like the simplest type of agent. So overall, really difficult to properly implement agents. Um, that being said, uh, in order to do, I mean, I don't know, kind of all of the cool things we as humans want to do uh, with AI and, and have AI do for us, we need things that um, are able to web uh, navigate websites in the same way we are, uh, look up information, use um, software tools, use physical tools, and all of those things are going to be agents. Uh, and actually getting them working uh, is just going to be really, really difficult uh, and super domain specific. Yep. So concretely, if we look at, you know, a question here of which company manufactured lost gravity, um, you might have sub problems that you need to solve within there. And each sub problem might require you to call out to a tool. So in this case, they have like a retrieve tool that can go and figure out, uh, given the question, get some context. And then they might have a single hop uh, question answering tool that can take in some of that context and actually answer the question. So in this case, um, what they argue in the uh, decomposed prompting with tools paper is that you can give it a bunch of n-shot examples of the different types of way that you could break down a problem. So in this case, it's not always tools. It might just be like, hey, if you were asked concatenate the second letter of every word in John Smith using spaces. The first, you know, algorithmic thing that you might want to do is just split the words in John Smith. And then you might want to like for each word within there, what is the second letter of the word? And then finally, you might want to merge those things to get the final answer. So this is an example of, you know, a few steps that you have to take to solve this problem. And each one of these steps could just be like something that you're prompting the model to do algor algorithmically, or it could be a tool that you hop, that you slot into uh, that reasoning step and it'll go fetch some context or call the calculator, call the, call the weather API, et cetera. So an example prompt for this would look like this where you have a bunch of example questions and then each one of these are like a sub reasoning task so what awards have movies produced by people born in 1910 one so the first thing you have to go figure out or is like who was born in the year 1910 and then that's like a sub query that'll give you this answer and then for each movies, who was the number one producer. Uh, so that's the second problem. And then the third problem is which awards were given to number two. And then finally, you can get the list of rewards. So there's an example data set from this paper um, called comma QA, which has a bunch of these 
uh, problems with sub problems within them. So, you know, what movies have people from County Wyme acted in? So the first thing you'd have to do is like, or the country, is that a country? Wyme? Okay. <laughs> you'd have to figure out which people are from the country Wyme and then which movies they had acted in. And this data set even gives you a little passage that you're going to have to extract that from. And so we tried this sort of prompt on these examples. And let's take a look at what the output is. So yeah, we gave it, you know, that end shot prompt of a couple examples of how you would reason through these problems. And then given a question like this, what awards did the movies directed by Modi parody winners receive? Um, you can see the model's prediction. First, it said, who's been awarded this award? And it would extract an answer. And then secondly, which movies has number one directed? And then third, which awards were given to number two? And it can get to uh, its final guess here. So you have that big prompt of uh, a bunch of examples of how to do this. Um, and like Sander said, like maybe, you know, it's really, it's a really intensive task to come up with all of these examples. So maybe you just come up with five of breaking down five problems and those five alone can get the model to kind of break down the sub problems and come up with an answer itself. So that's decomposed prompting. And you can think of each one of these as a tool or could be a signal for you to go call an external tool or just like a reasoning step within the model. Cool. The next one is called plan and solved prompting. Uh, so you might see this in the context of like these software engineer agents. Um, I forget what the, the name of the hot one recently was, but um, maybe somebody can remind me there, but basically they'll have an LLM and you'll be given a pull request and the LLM's job is like first to create a plan to solve the pull request. And that plan will be kind of like a high level outline of the steps it wants to take to go try and solve the pull request. Um, and so the, the prompting that they use for this is inspired by this paper and Basically, in this case, they're looking at math word problems, like the GSM 8K ones that we were looking at last week. And a basic chain of thought prompt might be, let's think step by step. This paper extends it to say, let's first understand the problem and devise a plan to solve the problem. Then let's carry out the plan and solve the problem step by step. So you can see in just the step by step example, It'll break down first, let's do this. Next, let's do this. When you add devise a plan, it puts a plan at the top and then a solution at the bottom. And they say just having the model break this out into uh, multiple steps helps it reason through the problem. You can also give it some additional uh, prompting, not just devise a plan, but in this case, they say first extract all the variables, then devise, devise a plan, then calculate intermediate results, pay attention to the calculation and common sense to solve the actual answer. So you can see here, you know, they're really breaking this down into more concrete steps than just saying, let's think step by step. Um, and so this is called plan and solve prompting. If you remember last week, we kind of looked into the GSM 8K data set and realized that most of the models are getting like 95% accuracy on that task. Um, and that's even the task that this paper was evaluated on. Um, right after we talked about that last week, Apple came out with a pretty spicy paper um, and a new data set called GSM Symbolic that was trying to understand the limitations of mathematical 
reasoning in the large language model. And uh, they kind of saw a similar thing to what we were seeing, where they say adding a single clause that seems relevant to the question causes significant performance drop off up to 65% across all state of the art models. Um, so this is just a sign that we're probably overfitting to some of these benchmarks. And I actually saw that Gretel AI, who is a synthetic data company, uh, put together a synthetic GSM 8K <laughs> data set uh, to try to test and validate some of this stuff that Apple was talking about last week. So this is the data set we're going to be looking at for this prompt. Uh, very similar Greg, to... Give yeah. a second. Josh has a question. Raise his hand, too. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I had a question about the plan and solve and the decomposition. Um, it seems like you're doing very similar things. Like, does one supersede the other? Is it better to just use one over the other, for example? Because I know like a while ago, before Chain of Thought came out, they said, you know, think step by step. And then Chain of Thought kind of took hold afterwards. So in my mind, Chain of Thought is an improvement on think step by step. And I'm wondering if plan and solve is an improvement on uh, task decomposition. So yeah, ex exactly. They are they are building on top of each other, and uh, each paper kind of like back references the one before it. So plan and solve, you can think of as coming after chain and thought as like an extension to it, and they compare results to chain of thought and argue that it's better on these like mathematical reasoning type tasks. Thanks. No problem. Um, so yeah, here would be an example of one of these mathematical reasoning type tasks. And this is actually synthetic data generated from Gretel AI, like I mentioned. So it's talking about a Garcia family from Spain planning a five-day trip to Paris, and then a bunch of different, you know, how much the trains cost, how much the planes cost. And then the final answer is how much will each person get if they book a hotel for the entire five-day stay. And the chain of thought reasoning will be breaking that down. And with this data set, they actually released the chain of thought reasoning generated from a model as well. And they put the, the raw answer at the bottom with these like four hash marks here. So um, what we wanted to do was look at uh, this plan and plan and solve type prompt. Um, and I, I did a bunch of iterations on this. So at first, <laughs> I just extracted the raw answer from um, the bottom of this, this string. And I did that with a prompt itself. So I said, extract the final answer after the four hash marks from the text below. Um, and then that gave me, you know, a data set here with the answer so that we could compare it la later. And then the first uh, plan and solve prompt that I gave was, let's first understand the problem, devise a plan to solve the problem, and then carry out the plan and solve the problem step by step. So you can see here's the predictions for that prompt. And you can see this is GPT-40. It's calculating the transportation costs, calculating the hotel costs, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually it gets down to the bottom where it says each family member will get 150 pounds, I'm guessing that sign is. Maybe someone can correct me for miscellaneous expenses. So I did this on 100 rows. And naturally, the next thing that I wanted to see was, OK, well, let's extract all the answers from this uh, plan and solve prediction, because it's not too easy just to do a raw string match. So now you can see we have uh, the gold truth or the, the ground truth answer, our chain of thought uh, plan and solve prediction, and then the prediction that we extracted from there. And there's even you know some slight mismatches from the ground truth to the answer here, where you know, even little things like spacing in here make it hard for you to compare these side by side. 
So I used a third prompt uh, that was check the answer. And that uh, basically said, check if the following answers are equivalent or not. Answer with true or false, one word, all lowercase. And I gave it um, the answer from this column and the prediction from this column. And it put a final column of just is correct into the data set. And so you can see there's a couple that we got wrong here. And so for these 100 examples, we can see like what is the accuracy given the is correct column. And for this 100 question subset, we got an accuracy of 75%. So maybe let's like take a look at some of the ones that it got wrong. So what are the rows where is it is false? Um, under the hood, this is just writing some SQL to query the data frame itself. And here we go. So this is like the first one that it got wrong. And you can see it might have just been like a, a decimal point error. Um, so while you're like prompting and while you're trying to find the right prompt for your task, I think it's really helpful to go through and have a benchmark. And even if it's like an LLM as a judge judging the responses, you can see how quickly with three prompts, we, we went from a prompt to an accuracy and then to the individual data points that the model got wrong. And this is kind of the workflow that you're gonna wanna go through while you're deciding, should I just use a base chain of thought? Should I use chain of thought, plan and solve? And then once you look at some of these and come up with a hypothesis for how you can change it, maybe within the prompt you say, pay really close attention to uh, you know, where the decimal point is. And in this case, I actually don't think it was wrong because this was trying to say 30% instead of 30. So that was like, an example of where LLM as a judge could could also be wrong. So you know, humans in the loop for this for all of this is always good to to double check the work. Cool. The next one I think is uh, this is one of the most I'd say impact, impactful prompting techniques from 2023, and it's called Tree of Thought. And this is the one that argues that LLMs can kind of be both the system one type thinking and the system two type thinking. So system one is just like perception, things come in and you're immediately making reactions to whatever is in your world. System two is when you actually logically think through some problems. And what tree of thought does is it has the model come up with multiple possible steps and then use a tree like search to evaluate the progress at each step. So they have a really nice diagram of what this looks like. Um, and it's a bit mind bending when you just look at the diagram itself. But if you think of the most basic prompting, you're just going from input to output. If you think of chain of thought, you are generating some thoughts in between. So that step one, step two, until you get to the final output. And in, uh, there's even a paper right before this that was called self-consistency chain of thought that would generate three chain of thought reasoning steps and do a majority vote at the end. So tree of thought took all of that previous work and was like, well, if you're generating multiple different hypotheses, you can even do a tree search within those hypotheses. And at each step, while while you're doing the chain of thought reasoning, you should be evaluating that step for whether or not you should continue down that path or not. And so they give a really nice example of where um, tree of thought or where a basic prompting would not get you the right answer. And there's three three portions of this. There's the game of 24, there's creative creative writing tasks, and then there's five by five crossword puzzles. The game of 24 is probably the easiest one to wrap our heads around of why just regular prompting really struggles at this. And so the game itself 
is you have four numbers. So four, nine, 10, and 13. And the goal is to take those four numbers and come up with an equation that adds to 24. So the different thoughts that you might be generating within here are like, okay, I'm gonna take four and nine and I'm gonna add them together and then I'm gonna subtract 10 and then I'm gonna multiply by 13. And like that doesn't get you 24. So that might be a dead path when you're going down the reasoning because you realize that there's no possible way that you could make 24 from those first operations that you did. Um, and so what this looks like concretely is, I'll give you like a full end shot example here. Um, and this is from the paper itself. So they give a little preamble of use numbers and basic, basic arithmetic, these operations to obtain 24. Each step, you are only allowed to choose two of the remaining numbers to obtain a new number. And so they give some examples of the input might be four, four, six, eight. And these steps are first take four plus eight and you get 12, then uh, six minus four and you get two. And then finally you get the final answer here. So each one of these steps can be think of, can be thought of as the node in this tree search here. And then you have a second evaluator prompt as you're going through each one of those steps. And the evaluator prompt will look at the step and it'll look at the two numbers um, that you gave it and say, hey, is this a likely, a, is this a sure solution? Is this a likely solution? Or is this a, a impossible solution? So 10 plus 14, sure. Uh, 11 and 12, you can see it's trying all combinations and it says this is impossible. Um, 4, 4, 10, it tries a few things and it says, sure, this is a good way to go. Um, and so you kind of have these two prompts working in tandem and you can either do a breadth first search or a depth first search down the tree to get to the final answer. And the at least on these specific tasks, you can see that tree of thought just flows chain of thought out of the water. So let me get you some concrete numbers here. Um, so this is on the game of 24 task. So a simple input output prompt gets like 7.3% accuracy. Chain of thought actually went down a little bit. Um, and then you can see tree of thought goes all the way up to 74% on this task. Um, so right, at each step, is it calculating a probability, like you were saying, to determine whether it should continue down the tree or, or go reverse course and go take a different path? So yeah, it's actually just using another prompt and saying and having the model output sure, likely, or impossible. So it's kind of having okay. the model evaluate itself. Um, rather than a raw probability. Okay. But I think that's a good intuition is you could have, you know, this is kind of the most simplistic setup here, but you could have like a reward model type model that's only job is to <laughs> give a probability to should we continue down this tree or not. Um, right. It's, and this is just like it, in MBA school, one of my favorite classes was quantitative decision making. And where you could, where you had these, Free of thought type decisions, and at every point you did a net present value calculation to determine should you should you is the decision yes or should you uh, change your mind, and you could yep. kind of in the at the do an ex post facto evaluation of your decision and look at what after it's all done and look at the five these are the five most influential factors on the decision that happened. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you even get some interpretability like within there of why it might have done the thing it did. The sensitivity analysis. Nice. That's what they call Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> I thought as I was going through this section of the paper that this tweet was super relevant. Um, so this was right when the 
paper was announced, uh, Sasha Rush said, man, you've branded a method to give OpenAI exponential more money because at each step of the tree, uh, you're making another OpenAI API call. Um, and this is kind of where I left off with our evaluations is I took this data set that they had from the paper of game of 24. And I took that initial prompt that they gave from the paper. So there are about uh, 1,362 examples here. And running that through running that prompt through GPT-40 was going to cost me about $5 uh, <laughs> to do just not even the evaluation prompt, but the like thought generation prompt. Um, so probably not the best use of $10 to just try to solve these game of 24 problems, but, uh, I thought it was good to give you like some concrete, how expensive would this method be, even though it gives you really high performance, um, in terms of accuracy, just think of the compute costs and think of the problem that you're actually going to want to solve, uh, when you apply this technique. Um, it's not always just about the, the accuracy score, but you're going to have to balance cost and this kind of stuff. I see that we're coming up on 10 minutes left, and I know that this group uh, has a lot of thoughts on prompting, and we have some experts in the audience. So maybe I'll switch back over to the questions we came to at the start. And, and Sander, are there any uh, of these prompting techniques that really stood out to you or surprised you as you as you were making the taxonomy, or maybe even ones that you use really often today. Yeah, so I would say the number one technique that I've I've uh, added to my toolkit is contrastive chain of thought prompting, uh, which is in the thought generation uh, session, of course. Uh, it it really was not something I thought of before. Uh, and the idea here uh, is that you want to show examples of what not to do, um, how not to reason. Uh, and it's a pretty cool idea. Uh, and it seems to be somewhat effective uh, with chain of thought or even with just regular few shot uh, showing like these are incorrect answers. Uh, so that one uh, is uh, is a favorite of mine. There's yeah, a number of things. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Just to build on that, um, even some of the research that I did back when I was at IBM Watson was called like uh, the unreasonable answer filter or the stupid answer filter. And you're trying to like, you know, when the model's playing Jeopardy, trying to get it to know whether it knows the right answer or not, whether to buzz in or not. And I feel like the contrastive prompting gives it something to latch on to, to be like, nah, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, so yeah, that's... Just... Yeah, uh, and then a couple of other maybe uh, techniques that are kind of uh, notable, but for the wrong reason, are things like uh, rereading uh, or role prompting. Uh, those techniques, I don't actually really believe in. Um, and we have a whole blog on learn prompting about uh, the difference between, uh, or sorry, uh, about role prompting and how effective it is. And I'll I'll link that in chat in a moment. But techniques like this, I don't really think they help uh, on, on most tasks with uh, modern models. Um, I think they're kind of like, and also things like emotion prompting. Uh, I think these things are kind of a bit misleading and haven't been studied very well uh, and in general uh, don't help at all. Yeah, so that would be an example of like, think really hard about it for the emotion process uh, prompting or like my grandmother is going to die if you don't answer this yeah. that's examples of that and then the this the role prompting is like your uh gold medalist uh in the math olympian or something um yeah. answer the question did you guys did you see some benchmarks on that or how did you kind of come to that conclusion uh, so, and I also noted in chat, like this is just for, um, accuracy based tasks, uh, like generative, you know, expressive task, writing based tasks, uh, are different. Uh, how did I come across this? I guess just sort of, uh, from doing a ton of prompt engineering, but then actually for the prompt report, we ran a benchmark 
which actually is not included in the paper, um, but we'll probably include in the official publication version where we had a bunch of different roles. Uh, and one of them was like uh, a genius role. So it's like you are a Harvard educated math professor, blah, 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 you're brilliant. And then there's an idiot role. And that one was like, you you can't do any math. You don't know how to do addition. You're, you're horribly unintelligent. Um, the idiot prompt outperformed the genius prompt somewhat. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so at that point, it's like, you know, I, at, at the very least, I can kind of confidently say we don't really understand uh, how rule prompting is helping. Uh, and it's probably not helping. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, that kind of leads nicely. Or I guess, Josh, do you have a, another question there? I see your hand raised. Yeah, I, um, there were certain things that I didn't necessarily see in the prompting guide, which I thought uh, are important, like basic concepts about logic, for example, like, you know, forming premises, you know, maybe even visiting speech and debate structure, um, but mainly like syllogis syllogisms. I'm not exactly sure how to say that word. Um, syllogisms, yeah. yeah but, uh, but that's what I often find lacking from these models is that they don't reason very well. They don't lay out their thinking in terms of like, these are the facts and these are the conclusions I made on these facts. Um, so that's kind of like where I've been uh, spending most of my prompt techniques on. Um, but I, I, I don't necessarily see that in a lot of these prompting guys. They don't really appeal to that old school uh speech and debate dialectic model. Interesting. Yeah, do you uh, do you have some like example problems that you're working through with that? Well, uh, yeah, like finance. I like to come up with these ideas in finance and I ask the LLM and then it's like, it does like this pro con with my idea. Like it's trying to like boost my ego and I'm like, no, I don't want you to be nice to me. I, I don't want to lose Answer money. The I question. Want to <laughs> Yeah. What's best practice, you know? Assume the role of a SME, cite your sources, you know? And it's always just kind of like taking my idea and and weighing both sides of it. And I'm just like, okay, that's like a little bit of reasoning. But, you know, I'm thinking like, why are you not grounding your responses in facts, more or less? Uh, yeah. That, that's really the main example. And that plays a lot into like RAG, because RAG, you are kind of context and then it does have something to work on and i think the dolly prompts were supposed to mimic that by regurgitating the input after the question um but i'm i'm a little fuzzy on all that because i have never actually used the dolly prompt to train any of my models got it yep that's great to think about and i i like to think about even yeah maybe in the rag context how can you separate even just the kind of like logical reasoning through the context that you retrieved versus just information that's encoded in the model itself. I think that's going to be an interesting line of research of how to split out reasoning from just knowledge that you know, because the knowledge or the information about the world is constantly being updated, but things like grammar and logic aren't. <laughs> so how do you know kind of the line between those two? Hey, Greg. Um, just Noting that I have a call at one, so I'm going to be hopping off, but this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, and I really look forward to future episodes. Awesome. Thanks for thanks for joining on, Sander. It was, it was a blast to have you. Um, yeah, thanks a bunch. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for being here. All right. Have yes. a good one. Thanks, Sander. We have to hop as well, um, but thanks, you guys, for joining. Um, we're, we're rolling out that tool that we were showing during the call for, for prompt engineering, we give like 10 bucks of free credit. So feel free to hammer the system there and, and try out some of these prompts yourself. Hey. And